What do crawfish, Clark Gable, a St. John the Baptist Parish Chief Deputy, and this almost 25-year-old family reunion t-shirt have in common? If you're interested to find out, join me, David Hubble, as we explore another River Parish recipe that's been lost but is now found. I know you want to find out, don't you? Come on. Hey folks, welcome to the third episode from the series I call River Parish Recipes Lost and Found. In each episode, I share with the viewers an old recipe I found and prepared, as well as tell a little bit about the person it's credited to, where it's from, and maybe some of the current events of the day. In this episode, I found a recipe from Mrs. R. N. Sanji of Reserve, Louisiana, which appeared in the March 6, 1937 edition of the New Orleans Times-Picayune. The recipe is Crayfish with Eggs, which was listed both under the French and English titles. Although it should be noted, whoever was in charge of editing really screwed up the French. You see, it's listed as Ecrevis à Boeuf, which means crawfish with beef. As opposed to Ecrevis à Oeufs, crawfish with eggs. Yes, folks, that B and S can sure make a difference in this dish. My name is David Hubble, and I've spent over 30 years studying the genealogy and history of the German Acadian coast. For those who don't know, that's roughly St. James, St. John the Baptist, and St. Charles Parishes of Louisiana. In addition to that, I started learning a little bit about the cooking and growing of foods in that area and region, because this is where all my ancestors came from. Some branches go back as far as the 1720s, others as recent as the 1850s. Part 1. The Story Behind the Recipe From roughly 1921 through 1943, the New Orleans Times-Picayune would solicit four or five recipes from its readers each Saturday. It was called the Prize Recipe Contest, and the incentive was a chance to win money for your recipes as well as see them published in the following Saturday's paper. The recipes requested consisted of all types of courses, from appetizers to desserts, or maybe just a specific ingredient from the region. Now, the contestants would primarily come from the newspaper's readership area, New Orleans, the River Regions, the North Shore Biloxi, just to name a few areas. The prizes were awarded for original recipes or as original as a classic recipe would permit. Now, if a recipe was found to be copied from a cookbook, then the contestant would be disqualified. In 1937, the prize was $2 per winning recipe, which in 2017 is equivalent to $33.52. Contestants could conceivably win all five for a grand prize of $10, which would be about $168 today. If you watch the first episode on Creole uh, Fricassee Shrimp from Mrs. L. O. Wagaspack, you might remember that the prize winning contest in 1928 offered four prizes at $2.50 per winning recipe. So obviously things changed a little bit in that nine years. I'm not sure if it was a result of the Great Depression or maybe just an opportunity to have more winners per week. The Saturday, February 27, 1937 edition of the Times-Picayune ran the following ad. Let your best recipe win a prize for you. Here's another chance to test your culinary skills against the hundreds who are weekly competing in the Times-Picayune recipe contest. This week, the Times-Picayune will give $10 in cash prizes, $2 each for the five best suggestions for crawfish dishes other than bisque for our visitors. Send in your best recipes. You may win all prizes. Now, this challenge was accepted by many, including Mrs. R. N. Sanji of Reserve, Louisiana. And it may have been prompted by the fact that in 1937, they received a much earlier and bountiful crawfish season than they had previously seen. 
So at this point, you might be wondering, who was Mrs. R.N. Sanji? This was back in the days where the wives would be recognized by their husbands' names. Thus, we need to determine who R.N. was. Well, check in the 1930 census records for Reserve, Louisiana. We find a Raphael Namor Sanji as the only R.N. Sanji in the area. It turns out Raphael was born across the river in the town of Edgard, more than likely on or near the Evergreen Plantation. He was of French and German Acadian descent. His parents were Cyprian, a.k.a. Charles Honoré Sanji Jr. and Amélie Laurent. He attended Leon Gottschall High School in Reserve and graduated in 1924 and was listed as the class president. From there, he held various positions, first as a manager of a Piggly Wiggly in New Orleans in 1928, then a general merchandise salesman back in Reserve in 1930 working at the plantation store with his father. By 1940, he was a sugar ware and finally chief deputy for St. John the Baptist Parish Sheriff's Percy Bear for 33 years from 1941 to 1974. He was a very hard worker and rarely took any vacation days except for illnesses and such. He was also noted to be a very devout Catholic and attended St. Peter's Catholic Church in Reserve, Louisiana and volunteered for a lot of uh, activities with the church. He was a Grand Knight in the Knights of Columbus and received the medal Pro Ecclesia at Pontifes in 1954 for distinguished service as a layman. And here's a wonderful picture, probably from around the time he graduated high school, from uh, Chantel Landry's Ancestry.com files on this branch of the family. Now I'm going to go out on a limb and assume that Raphael had a pretty good sense of humor. I came across several humorous submissions that he made to the Times Picayune over the years. This one was recorded by Howard Jacobs in his Ramalad column on April 21, 1956. Celebrities infest St. John's Sheriff's Office. The Sheriff's Office at St. John the Baptist Parish at Edgard doesn't, as a rule, do business with celebrities, but they surely got a passel of reasonably exact facsimiles this week. Here is a rundown of the, on the names encountered as provided by Chief Deputy Raphael N. Sanji. Monday, man walks in to pay a traffic fine, name Clark Gable. Tuesday, we are given an order to seize a car from a man for a debt, name Eddie Fisher. Thursday, we receive in the mail a fine for a traffic violation, name Joe DiMaggio. Same day, we receive a letter from a Romero, he concluded, but it wasn't Caesar. Obviously, you got to be a certain age to recognize those names and see the humor here. But I thought it was pretty clever. So now that we know that RN was Raphael Numars, we can now say that who Mrs. RN was. She was the former Nylefter Philomene Gregoire. Mother Nye, as she was called by her family, was born upriver in Donaldsonville on January 16, 1907. Documents found on Ancestry.com indicate that she was the daughter of Joseph N. Gregoire and Anna Carbo, and of French and Spanish ancestry. The family moved to reserve when she was around nine, and like her husband, she too attended Leon Gotcha High School and was also part of the class in 1924. Her youngest daughter, Margaret Tack, told me that she also attended the Louisiana Normal School in Natchitoches, Louisiana, where she earned a lifetime teaching certificate and even taught some in that area before her marriage. She too was a devout Catholic and attended St. Peter's Catholic Church in Reserve and was a member of their Ladies Altar Society and the Ladies Auxiliary of the Knights of Columbus, Monsignor A. Rod Council, as well as part of the Mother's Club for the school. She was apparently a very skillful cook and was, has won at least uh, 10 recipe contests between 1935 to 1947. In addition, she would also cook for a lot of the uh, previously mentioned church groups as well, like bake sales and such. Margaret remembers several dishes that uh, fondly that her mother made, especially a fruit cake. There was also a dish that her older sister remembered, sort of a gingerbread cake. Then there was things such as crawfish bisque, white beans with river shrimp, and also a potato and oyster dressing. Now, the picture here is also from Chantel Landry's wonderful collection of Sanji pictures from this branch of the family, and appears where my left is maybe around high school age.
As I previously mentioned, both Raphael and Nylefter attended Leon Gottschall High School as a member of the class of 1924. Raphael was almost 21 when he graduated, so he must have been delayed at some point during his formal education. I was thrilled to find a photo of the 1924 class in the December 2001 issue of the German Acadian Coast Historical and Genealogical Society's Les Voyageurs quarterly publication, which was written in the photo and the article were originally published from the May 3, 1924 issue of L'Observateur, the newspaper for that area, which is still around today, by the way, in case you're interested. As the article details, the commencement exercise was held at the Liberty Pavilion before a large crowd, and in all, there was a class of 24 students. They had 14 girls and 8 boys, and they received their diplomas from the superintendent, L.F. Laurent. Now, following the exercise, a dance was held. And if you want to find out, uh, looking at the picture, you can find Nylefter in the front with an N and Raphael in the back with an R. Raphael and Nylefter obviously knew each other for a number of years. After all, growing up in a small town like Reserve and being part of the same graduating class, it wasn't hard not to know each other. I can't say whether or not they were high school sweethearts, but five years after graduation, on January 30, 1929, they wed at St. Peter's Catholic Church in Reserve. Together they had ten children. In the order of birth, there was June, who is now deceased, Patricia, who is also deceased, as well as Raphael Jr., who is also deceased. Milton Sr., Neil, Miriam, Rhoda, James, Lance, and their youngest daughter, Margaret, who's been of immense help to me in collecting data on the family. Now, if you're not familiar, Reserve is located 43 miles west and upriver from New Orleans on the east bank of the Mississippi River in St. John the Baptist Parish. Looking at the map, it's just to the right of the red balloon with an A in it. Moving in a little closer on the map of Reserve from Google Maps, we can see the layout of the town as well as some of the featured uh, streets and um, businesses. Now the land here was pretty much occupied since uh, before the 1770s. In the 1800s, the town was known by three different names based upon the location of the post office. Early on it was known as Bonacare, then St. Pierre Bonacare, and then Gottschall's Reserve Plantation, which was where the post office was moved in 1916. Reserve basically got its name from Reserve Plantation. Now Leon Gottschall was perhaps one of the town's most famous, if not famous, resident. He bought a sugar uh, plantation in 1869 and started milling and refining there in 1883. And it pretty much employed a lot of folks in that town. And uh, by the early 1900s, it was listed, Reserve that is, was listed as one of the most important towns in St. John the Baptist Parish. Nearby um, tourist attractions one might look for is San Francisco Plantation, which is located about three miles away. Now, if you look in the center of the map, you'll see Dodd's Country Store. And if you head down toward the river to where you see the word Reserve, and just above the second E, there's a 53. And going up that road, that's where... R.N. Sanji and his family lived. As I have done in previous episodes, I like to see if I can find where the recipe might have been cooked originally. The Sanji home was located at 126 Central Avenue, which has since been renumbered to 190, and is presently a dentist office. While I'm not 100% certain this is where they lived in 1937, we know that Raphael owned it from at least the mid 40s until he sold it in about 1986. As an interesting side note, the house in the background belonged to Raphael's brother, Antoine Sanji. Additionally, across the street lived their sister, Sylvia, and her husband, Edmund Torres. Once again, thanks to the courtesy of Chantelle Landry and her Sanji information on Ancestry.com, we have a picture of what Sylvia Sanji Torres' home looked like on Central Avenue in Reserve back in the 1950s. 
and thanks to the courtesy of Google Maps we can see what it looks like today. The uh, current address is 186 Central Avenue. So Raphael, Antoine, and Sylvia were one of or were three of four children. So it's interesting that three of the four children all lived within a stone's throw of each other. So at this point in the presentation, I'd like to discuss what life would have been like in the town where the in the year that the recipes were published. Now electricity was brought to the nearby town of Laplace, which is about five miles away in 1923 by Armand Monsignor, who had an ice factory. It was later taken over by Louisiana Power and Lighting Company in 1927, so by then most of the homes in the areas probably had some form of electricity. Now there were no municipal treated water in St. John the Baptist Parish until 1956, but they would have had cisterns, which would have been used for drinking, bathing, and cooking, possibly springs in the area, wells, and even river water. Now, it's noted that in addition to providing electricity, Armand Munt Sr. also had six water wells that he had made available to members of the community in the 1920s. However, I'm not sure if that would have extended all the way to reserve. Now, similar to municipal water, there was also no natural gas infrastructure until 1956 in St. John the Baptist Parish. And of course, there would have been propane tanks available, however, for use. Also, no AC was likely since the Windows units really weren't invented until 1932, and they really weren't available widely in the U.S. until 1947. So it's possible they could have had electric and gas heating too, but uh, and indoor plumbing, but I bet it was pretty rare still out in these rural areas. Um, so thinking about this with the use of cisterns, that still meant probably infrequent baths were taken, and then they probably still had the use of an outhouse. Um, even though electric refrigeration would have been available, it all depended upon the availability of power to the house in the area. So there still may have been the use of ice boxes. And finally, electric stoves were available in the 1930s, but more than likely gas or wood stoves and ovens would have been the norm. And talking to uh, Margaret, she mentions that in the house still had a cistern in use until the 1950s, and that her siblings remembered talking about a belly stove. So in all likelihood, when Mrs. Sanji invented this recipe or created this recipe to publish it, she cooked it on a wood-burning stove and used cistern water as her main liquid. Now a few comments about the Sanji family. Raphael's father, Charles Honoré Jr., and my great-grandfather, Luc Lionel Sanji, were brothers. Their parents were Honoré Sr. and Ladois Gamarie Schechsneider. Now I found this old family portrait in a family history binder that my mama Jean Sanji Robert had. The photo appears to be from around 1901, based upon the number of family members and the names in the 1900 census. On the top row we have Honoré Sanji Jr., Ladois Schechsneider, Honoré Sanji Sr., and Cecilia Sanji. On the bottom we have Lamy Sanji, Michael Sanji, who's the toddler, Regina Sanji, Justin Sanji, Corinne Roussel, who is Honoré Sr.'s mother, Sidoni Sanji, Luc Lionel Sanji, my great grandfather, and Septimin Sanji. And you can find Honoré Jr. or Charles Honoré Jr. with a C over his part of the picture, and my great grandfather, Luc Lionel, with an L. Now, I can't have a discussion about the Sanjis in St. John the Baptist Parish without at least talking about the Evergreen Plantation in Edgard, located across the river from Reserve. Now, Honoré Jr. and Luke's uncles, Alfred and Edward Sanji, purchased the old Becknell Plantation in 1894 and renamed it Evergreen. A lot of the extended Sanji family were employed or lived on or near the property. For example, my great-grandfather Luke worked there as a blacksmith, and my grandmother was raised on Johnson Lane in nearby Wallace. Alfred and Edward had seven siblings, so Evergreen holds a special place in the hearts and the descendants of this branch. Now, according to an article from Mary Ann Sternberg for the Preservationist magazine on July 1, 2013, it was learned that the Sanjis ended up having to lose the plantation in 1930 to the bank due to a number of financial setbacks. Primarily, the 1927 flood ruined the sugarcane crop that year. 
Then it was followed by the sugarcane mosaic disease, and then finally the Great Depression in 1929. She also noted that many of the Sanji family members still work the cane fields around the plantation today. Now this photo was taken in 1982 by my late aunt, Jean Robert Lanza. Some final comments on Mr. and Mrs. R. N. Sanji Sr. The above pictures once again brought to us courtesy of Chantel Landry's Ancestry.com page. And I would venture to say is from the mid to early 1970s. Their daughter, Margaret Tack, had several fond memories that she shared of her parents, how hardworking and thrifty they were, how her father had a large, uh, large garden that he was able to feed the family with, and how they would attend daily mass, her parents would attend daily mass as often as possible, and as a family, how they would gather together and say the rosary in the evenings. So hopefully these last few minutes have given you a brief idea of the woman and the family behind this recipe. Now left her Philomene Gregoire Sanji died in reserve at 4 a.m. on Friday, December 10, 1976, at the age of 69. Her funeral services were held at 11 a.m. at St. Peter's Catholic Church in reserve on December 13th, and she was later interred in the church cemetery. Raphael outlived his wife by almost 12 years, originally staying in the home in reserve, but later moving down to Metairie to live with one of his children. He died on Tuesday, October 18, 1988 in Metairie, and his funeral was held at St. Peter's Catholic Church as well on October 21st. He and I left her are in appeared to be interred with his parents, according to an article I found in Les Voyageurs periodical. Part 2. The Recipe First, a little background on crawfish. Now, in several accounts I looked up, it was noted that the Native Americans and early European settlers of Louisiana ate crawfish. This, like many other foods, was something that folks had to go out and catch in order to enjoy which, given the fact that they were so abundant, probably wasn't too difficult. However, if you were one of the city dwellers in New Orleans, you probably, and you didn't go out hunting and fishing as often, it was probably a little more difficult to get hold of. It was noted that the first commercial production of crawfish in Louisiana was in 1880, and probably was made possible by the invention of some early crawfish nets. It was pretty much considered by many of the folks outside of these areas where it was popular as a poor man's food, up until it became uh, popular with some of the festivals in the 1960s. Did you know that there are 39 different species of crawfish found in Louisiana? Only two of these are really targeted for commercial harvest in the state and in the reserve area. They are the red swamp crawfish, which is about 70 to 80 percent of the harvest, and the white river crawfish, which makes up the remaining 20 to 30 percent. So you can tell them apart by looking at them. Um, the red Swamp crawfish has a brown to bright red in color, is a blackish brown stripe down the abdomen, and is more flattened claws. Also, uh, when you pick it after it's been cooked, it has a golden flavorful uh, fat in the tail that's highly prized by those who eat it. On the white uh, crawfish, you can tell them because they're various shades of brown in color, no stripe down the abdomen, a little more elongated claws, and when you look at their fat, it's a more of a bluish gray tinge and not very aesthetically pleasing. So you'll see the white to the right and um, you'll also see it being photobombed by a turtle. Today we are blessed to have crawfish caught and processed for our convenience to buy at many locations throughout Louisiana and the Gulf Coast. But how would they have been obtained in 1937? Now, an article from the March 12, 1937 Baton Rouge Advocate mentions how you would catch crawfish. The crawfishermen would seek a river for the white crawfish or a bayou or a dark stagnant pool for the swamp crawfish. You could tell if there were crawfish in the area because you would see there are mounds of mud, also known as chimneys, in ditches, rivers, streams, lakes, bayous, etc. And they described the crawfish as an opportunistic omnivore. That was, it was basically a scavenger and it was even known to be cannibalistic. So what you would do, kind of like a fishing pole, is you would tie a cord to a stick, and on the other end of the cord, a piece of salted meat, and then you'd spit on the salted meat and throw it in the water, and you would sit there with the bait in the water until you see the cord is being tugged. 
and you'd lift it up slowly and you'd put a net up underneath it and you'd catch the crawfish. And it was implied that this was the preferred method for the river people, which I'm assuming is the people in the river parishes, for catching crawfish at that time. Now the other technique is was a flat square net which had four pieces of uh, line tied on each corner and they were tied to the end of a pole. And in the middle you would put a piece of fatty beef and then you would let that net sink into the water and then you would pick it up from time to time and where you would find the crawfish would be chewing on the fatty meat and then as you lifted it up the sides would lift and the crawfish would be caught in the middle. And this was probably used more for commercial practices early on. I also want to take a moment to talk about the difference between Louisiana and Chinese crawfish. Basically the Chinese crawfish is the same red swamp crawfish found in Louisiana that ended up making its way to China via Japan. Now they ended up in the rice fields in China where they, were where they flourished and became invasive. Now in order to manage the problem, the Chinese started to process them and sell them to the US in 1991. Now due to their abundance, they basically were able to dump huge amounts of crawfish in the US market for ridiculously cheap prices. This uh, ended up leading to a bunch of the Louisiana processors being closed and in turn, after many years of lobbying, this led to an anti-dumping tariff imposed in 1997, and it has been renewed a couple of times over the last 20 years. Now, in addition to lost jobs in Louisiana, the Louisiana Crawfish Farmers Association asserts that there are certain health risks with Chinese crawfish due to the chloramphenicol, uh, due to chloramphenicol, which is an antibiotic banned in food substances by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, and often it's found in imported Chinese crawfish. Now, the Louisiana ponds and crawfish are tested repeatedly, but there's really no testing in China for these banned substances. Now, it's oftentimes difficult to determine whether you're buying Chinese or Louisiana crawfish tails due to the fact that the Chinese, the frozen packs of tails are sold in supermarkets, but are labeled with Cajun, common Cajun or Louisiana names to create the impression that the product is from Louisiana. Um, but the USDA has a mandatory country of origin label labeling program in place. So you ought to be able to read on there in the fine print that it's product of the US or product of China. Um, in addition to that, some helpful hints is that usually if you find crawfish tails at a ridiculously low price, anywhere $8 or less, more than often it's going to be the Chinese product. The other thing is that the Chinese product will be in 12 ounce packages as opposed to 16 ounce packages, which is the more common vo volume that it's sold in, in the uh, Louisiana tails. The other thing that from experience I've noticed is that the cra Chinese crawfish tails tend to have more of a fishy taste than the Louisiana product. That has to be due to a certain extent with the fat that it's packaged with from the, the tails. Some of that prized for its flavor, but if it sits too long, I think I've read more than three or six months in a freezer, it starts to get a fishy flavor. So my recommendation is that you, you're better off just to always choose Louisiana crawfish. It helps out with the processors in the state and you'll get a much better tasting product to put on your dish. Finally, on to the ingredients. Because it was listed in the newspaper in a narrative form, I had to try to extract the information into a list. Also, in a couple of cases, they weren't very specific, so I was able to come up with some measurements that I thought were suitable. So, one quart of crayfish, which is two pounds of crawfish tails, which you see it pictured here is only a one pound bag, but for this full recipe, you need two pounds. A half a cup of shallots, which in South Louisiana, a shallot is the same thing everybody else calls green onion tops. Two bay leaves, two tablespoons parsley, finely minced. Personally, I like uh, curly parsley. Um, five fresh yard eggs, two thirds a cup unsalted butter, two thirds cup white flour, a half to one teaspoon red cayenne pepper, one to two teaspoons of salt, and one quart of water. Step one. Now the recipe calls for you to make a dark brown roux. However, it doesn't tell you how much. So 
since it appears to be very similar to a crawfish stew, I looked up the proportions to use for two pounds of crawfish in a stew. Now, it also wasn't sure of what kind of oil the, that was being used to make this roux. Would they have used lard, vegetable, or butter? Now, since many consider this area a mixture of German, French, Creoles, as well as Cajun, I would I looked at the different options, because there's a lot of different roux if you really look into it. And I chose a Creole roux made with butter, as defined by Chef John Fols in his Encyclopedia of Cajun and Creole Cuisine. So to make this roux, I used two-thirds of a cup of melted butter and two-thirds of a cup flour over medium to medium-high heat. And this takes approximately 23 to 30 minutes on my electric stove. Um, in the ingredients I called out for unsalted butter, here I think I just used salted butter. It didn't really matter. You can just adjust your uh, seasonings toward the end. Now, step two. You should season your crawfish tails with red pepper and salt, the red pepper here being cayenne, and then you'd add that to the roux, and you'd fry about five to ten minutes, then add shallots. Now, once again, back in 1937, they didn't have the convenience of the pre-shelled tails, so obviously they would have had to catch the crawfish, parboil them, or even boil them with a little salt and pepper, as I found uh, in the um, newspaper articles of the day, and then peel them to be able to have two pounds to make this dish. So it's a little more labor intensive back in 1937 than it is in 2017. Now step three, you add the water and bay leaves and parsley. Now there are a couple bay varieties in, the, uh, in Louisiana. There's the swamp bay leaf or the bay laurel, which has been popular I believe in New Orleans since the early 1900s. And I believe mine is a bay laurel that uh, is from a plant that my grandfather had given me from one he had in his yard in Metairie. Step four. So when the gravy is the consistency that you like it, either thick or thin according to your taste, break one egg into the gravy based in the crawfish, or crayfish as it said in the article, with a rich mixture until the egg is cooked. It takes about a minute. And so I've got a demonstration here with the assistant of, uh, assistance of my lovely wife, Astrid. And um, I don't know if I had my sauce hot enough because it took a little longer than a minute. But you can see it, uh, it was very nice, thick sauce. And um, we just simply ladled the sauce back onto it. And you'll see that it gets cooked a little bit more. Step five, then break the remaining eggs quickly into the gravy, letting it cook until set, keeping them whole and more appetizing in appearance when served. So now you can see that they've started to whiten and solidify. Step six, you can ladle out some of the crawfish sauce and gravy and then carefully ladle out the eggs whole and put them on top. And I chose this uh, D.H. Holmes gumbo bowl that my mama had given me back when I was in my 20s. And Mrs. Sanji suggests garnish them with toast points and lemon slices and serve on a large platter. So now I'm giving you an action shot. And I got to say that I really enjoyed this recipe. Maybe it's because of the simplicity of the ingredients, but I think the Creole roux and the crawfish really evoked thoughts of maybe or some sort of imprinted thoughts in my mind of my mama's kitchen. And um, this is kind of an old time dish. Really would be a great brunch type of dish. Part three, lanyap. So what kind of brands of the day would have been used if you were making this recipe in 1937, say in New Orleans? Uh, salt, you'd have the Morton salt. The brand's been around for a long time, and uh, they had the iodized versions available at the time, going back to the early 1920s. Uh, butter, you probably would have gone and picked up some Morning Glory or some Brookfield brand. Uh, flour, they'd have Realm Pleasing. I think that was in Baton Rouge. Capital. 
white fan, and little king. Now, uh, I think some of these flowers would not be enriched, but they were a lot of self-rising options at the time. Of course, if you were out in the country, out in the river parishes, you might have made your own butter. Uh, things like cayenne, probably you either uh, dried your own cayenne peppers and made the seasoning yourself. Um, so that's some of the ones that you might find if you were trying to do this in town. Now, by 1937, you really didn't have to make all your own ingredients or grow them. You actually could go to the various grocery stores in the area and purchase some of these things. So in reserve, you might go to C. Altamont and Brothers store or J.R. Cienos. Plus, I read there's a lot of truck peddlers that would travel up and down the roads selling their various wares, you know, like a steak truck, a meat truck, a bread truck. Um, also, as a side note, Altmont would make home deliveries from phone orders. Now, if you were in New Orleans, you had a wider variety of grocery stores, obviously, being more of a city and a metropolitan area. So you had places like A&P, Piggly Wiggly, H.G. Hill Store, Martin J. Cull, the rhyming grocer. He had quite a lot of uh, ads that were written in rhyme. Pretty interesting. Theo A. Shiro, Canal Villery, and the place called Louisiana stores. In addition, you know, you probably have the option to go to the old French market and, and get some of the produce you might need, especially if you're looking for a fresh farm egg. Now, it should also be noted that, uh, as I talked about before, you know, a lot of times you would catch a crawfish if you were out in the country, but if you were in New Orleans, unless you went out somewhere to catch them, you would probably be able to purchase them from a few places. I saw ads for crawfish at places like Fry, Piconis and Solaris. Now, as I've done with the other two episodes, I also want to take a moment to reflect on the water source that would have been used when making this dish. Um, as I talked about, they didn't have municipal water available at the time in 1937. So the primary drinking and cooking source would have been cistern water. And I think it's important because I believe that these probably would have imparted somewhat of a unique taste to a dish. So uh, this was rainwater that's collected off the tops of the roofs into tanks made out of cypress boards. They would expand as the water would fill and seal any gaps in between the boards. It required a yearly cleaning as sludge would build up. And then you also had issues with mosquito larvae and other roof debris, such as leaves, bird droppings. And in some cases, they would boil the water before use. In other cases, they wouldn't. Now, the Sanji's youngest daughter, Margaret Sanji Tack, had told me that um, she definitely remembered getting water from a cistern at the house in reserve and seeing the little red uh, larva in there. So obviously they would have to scoop and strain those out. Uh, there might have been some sp spring water available in some places. Now, the water, running water, like I said, was not available in reserve until 1956. But in New Orleans, the area did have municipal water, and it should have been readily available in 1937, since it's reported that most homes had a connection by 1917. And its source starts with the Mississippi River. So I'd like to also add a few cooking suggestions. As I mentioned earlier, the original recipe called for a quart of crawfish tails. So I suggest after measuring out that two pounds of Louisiana crawfish tails would give you the best taste for this recipe. Uh, your cooking times, uh, which she really doesn't give any in this particular recipe, but cooking times for either a wooden or a possible gas stove would have been um, different than most of your electric or gas ranges today. So your temperature control probably would have been different then than it is now, um, probably not as precise. So really the only thing I would suggest is that you don't rush it and allow plenty of time to make your roux especially since you're using butter and they can burn easily. Um, there's a high probability that this would have been cooked in cast iron. Now, magnolite pots were popular in South Louisiana, but they really weren't introduced until the early 1930s. So there is the possibility it could have been cooked in magnolite. Um, aluminum and enamel covered iron pans were also available back in the 30s. But I would suggest if you're trying to get more of a, a rustic feel to it, try to uh, cook it in a black cast iron pot. And then finally, cistern water would have been more than likely the liquid used. So uh, I suggest, unless you already have a cistern that you can get water out of still, that you use a spring water or uh, you know some bottled spring water or filtered water to avoid any residual chemical taste. 
So here you have it, Eclavis of Oufs, Crawfish with Eggs, by Mrs. R. N. Sanji of Reserve, Louisiana, circa 1937. I want to take a moment to recognize the following individuals, for without their help, this presentation wouldn't be possible. Margaret Sanji Tack, the youngest daughter of Mr. and Mrs. R. N. Sanji Sr., for all her wonderful help and contributions and memories about her parents. Uh, Dwayne Laurent, neighbor of the Sanjis in the reserve area, and his wife, Susan Wagaspak Laurent, for all her wonderful help with reserve Louisiana's history, as well as uh, the uh, genealogy in the area. Melissa Kramer Himel and her help with uh, helping me identify the various species of crawfish in Louisiana and in the St. John the Baptist area. Chantal Landry and her wonderful pictures of this branch of the Sanji family found on Ancestry.com. My late aunt, Jean Robert Lanza, and her wonderful picture of Evergreen Plantation taken in 1982. My daughter, Caitlin Hubble, for her drawing of the cisterns that uh, help illustrate what these uh, structures looked like. Cousins Deidre Sanji Gobert and great uncle Ruffin Sanji for inquiries in this branch of the Sanji family. My late grandmother, Jean Sanji Robert, and her help with the pictures of her father and his family. Uh, Jay Sheck Snyder for his help in helping me pronounce all these wonderful old French terms. And for the members of the Sanji family page on Facebook created by Cousin Sandy Sanji. Thanks again for all y'all's help. And as always, thank you. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy day to view my presentations. I hope it was able to help further your education and interest in this area as well as some of its food customs. Full recipe can be found at www.riverparishcajunreview.com backslash or the direct link you see here will take you to the posting. Please send any questions, comments, or ideas for future presentation to David at rpcajun2r at gmail.com. Thank you again. Thank you.